Welcome back grade 12s. I hope that you really are packing in the information today and making sure that thanks to Liberty you are going to be ready for those exams at the end of the year. So you're with me for another short while, Helen DeVette, and we are focusing on problems that cropped up in the 2022 exam that we certainly don't want to crop up in your exam. We're looking at terms that were confused by the matric learners. Now, what if you've missed today's lesson and you don't have me on your TV screens helping you? Remember, in your back pocket, you have your cell phone and you have downloaded the Tenfold Education app, the Mindset app, and at any time you can watch the YouTube channel at Mindset Learn. So you're never alone in your endeavor towards your final exams. What confusing terms are we going to look at next? These terms relate to the brain. And once again, I'm not, I'm not surprised that they cause confusion. Cerebrum and cerebellum. All right, cerebrum and cerebellum. They sound like the names that a biologist would give to twins, don't they? So the cerebrum is the biggest part of your brain. And that is where your understanding lies. That is where all your sensory information goes so that you can make interpretations of what your sense organs feed to your brain. That's where you learn how to do your maths, how you learn to speak. That's where you keep all your memories and that's where you control voluntary skeletal action. Your cerebellum, on the other hand, is this part in the back of your brain, right? So what we would see here is our eyes looking forward. So at the back of your brain, towards your neck, here's the base of your skull. That's where your foramen magnum would be. You've got your cerebellum. And your cerebellum is going to assist you in balancing your body. It's going to assist that when you lean forward, you don't fall over forward. It's going to help you that when you change direction of your head, you keep your balance. And I want you to remember that the word cerebellum has L's in it. And your cerebellum is for, well, one of the things it does is to help you keep your balance. All right, so two different parts of the brain, two very different functions. A lot of voluntary control and thought happening in the cerebrum and involuntary control happening in your cerebellum. You can't voluntarily control your balance. If you lose balance, well, boom, you fall down. So we've got a, a, a set or a part of your brain that is doing involuntary things, very much like the medulla oblongata that is going to remind your organs to breathe, your heart to beat, all of those things that, that you're not consciously controlling. But lots of conscious control happens in your cerebrum. But just remember, balance, cerebellum at the back. All right, now it's not only commonly confused terms that seem to crop up, but processes as well, that there are similar sounding processes or processes that have got to do with the same organ and students confuse these processes. And one of the processes that I've come across with my students and so did the examiners come across, one of these sets of processes has to do with the eye. And we're looking here at the pupillary mechanism 
or the pupillary reflex. And the next term that it is confused with is accommodation. Now, you can see that these two processes don't look the same. They don't, they're not similarly spelt. They, one is accommodation, the other is the pupillary mechanism. But it is the process that learners are confusing. So we need to understand what is the difference between the pupillary mechanism and accommodation. They're both reflexes. So they've got that as a similarity. And they both have to do with your eyes. But we need to distinguish between them. And we need to be able to, remember right back to the beginning of our show today, explain them, not just be able to name them. So what do we mean by the pupillary mechanism? Well, this dark spot in the middle of your eye that is the pupil. And in fact, the pupil is not a thing. It's not like your iris, which is the colored part of your eye, or the sclera, or an eyelash, which is a thing. The pupil is in fact a hole, right? And the hole is where the light goes from the outside of your eye through the hole, it goes through the transparent cornea, which is over the front of the eye. It's the sclera over the front part of the eye. It's transparent, has to be. If it wasn't transparent, light wouldn't get in. And what you're seeing when you see this blackness at the back, you're seeing the back of your eye. The lens is also transparent, so light goes right through the cornea, the lens, and you are actually seeing your retina. That is what you're seeing through the pupil, which is a hole. Now, the retina is where your very, very sensitive photoreceptors are found. They are going to be, uh, they are the receptors that respond to the stimulus of light and they're going to send the message or the impulse what they have picked up they're going to send that along the optic nerve and the optic nerve is going to take the message to your brain for interpretation but your photoreceptors in your retina are very sensitive to light and you can damage those photoreceptors if they're exposed to very intense or bright light. And your eye has this mechanism, which is a reflex, to protect the retina from overexposure to very, very bright lights. Now, you have felt this. If someone has shone a torch or a very bright light in your eye, you tend to close your eyes and back away. And even if you open your eyes, you can still see little bits of light there. If you really are looking at something called a little bit of retinal damage. It's, it's only temporary, but those uh, photoreceptors keep firing messages off to the brain that says light, 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 too much light. And even if the person has moved the light out of your eyes, you're still seeing that light because of those very sensitive photoreceptors. So your eye has a way of cutting down on too much bright light coming into it. And that is, as we said before, the pupillary mechanism. So Let's focus on this picture, set of pictures first. In very bright light, because that's what we've been talking about, we see that the pupil gets smaller and that is going to limit the amount of light that can get through the pupil and into the retina. And how does that happen? Well, 
circular muscles. So those are muscles that form concentric circles in the iris. Here we go, in the blue or the brown, or the green part of your eye. Those circular muscles contract and it's like they are pulling this little hole smaller and smaller and you're going to see less light going through the pupil and having less of an impact on the retina and on your photoreceptor so it's not going to harm those very sensitive cells. And I know you've experienced the opposite, going from outside into, from bright sunlight into a dark room, you suddenly can't see because your pupil was narrowed down or contracted. So now the iris has to do the reverse. It's got to pull that hole called the pupil bigger. So what happens there is these circular muscles now will relax and instead radial muscles like the spokes on a wheel will pull that pupil wider and wider and the term we use there is dilation. So dilation makes the pupil larger contraction makes the pupil smaller and that is how the pupillary mechanism or the pupillary reflex happens. Also don't confuse this with your blink reflex. Your blink reflex is yes if bright light is is shone in front of you if someone comes with their hand to, and you think they're going to smack your face, you pull away and you close your eyes. Or if there's a lot of dust and sand in the air, you find yourself blinking a lot. That is to protect the cornea and the front part of your eye from becoming damaged by particles in the air or by someone trying to smack you. So there's the blink reflex, there's the pupillary mechanism, and then there is this thing called accommodation. Let's look at what accommodation is. Accommodation is a reflex that assists in focus. It helps you to focus on things close by and things further away. So how does accommodation work? Well, if you're going to be focusing on nearby objects, so let's imagine this person is reading a book, all right, so it's focusing on the words that are held close to the eye. The ciliary muscle, those are your ciliary muscles, contracts. The sclera, that's this, the white of your eye, is pulled inwards. And because it's pulled inwards, these suspensory ligaments go a little bit slack. The tension is not there. The sclera is not pulling outwards. The sclera has relaxed or pulled inwards. And so the tension on our suspensory ligaments is less and that allows the lens to go into a rounder shape. I want you to look at all the C's here. We're focusing on a close object. The ciliary muscle contracts and that makes your lens go into a C shape. Will you remember that? Whereas if we're focusing on a distant object, let's imagine that there's a tree over here and we're focusing on this object which is far away from our eyes, the ciliary muscle is going to relax. Right, there it is, it's now relaxed. And that causes the sclera to move outwards. 
and that puts tension on our suspensory ligaments. They become taut, they get pulled with tension and that causes the lens to flatten. So the lens is now longer because we're focused on things a, a further distance away. Just little things to help you remember that focusing on a close object, our lens is going to go C-shaped. Focusing on something that is a long way away, our lens is going to go longer, like an, like an L, all right? So when we're looking at these two processes, they do have similarities. They both are reflexes associated with the eye, but they do completely different things. Pupillary reflex or pupillary mechanism makes the pupil go smaller or bigger. And accommodation helps us see things close by in focus and look out at something that's further away and still be able to focus on it because of the change in the shape of the lens. Those two things, it's essential that you learn them. And go and look at other uh, processes in reproduction, hormones, the nervous system, and see that you are not confusing common mistakes, making common mistakes and confusing different processes in the body. I hope you'll join me again when we start looking at common mistakes in paper two. But between now and then, focus on paper one and look at terms that you often make a mistake with and try and make sure that you're not gonna make those mistakes in your final paper. Thank you for your time today, grade 12s, and I look forward to seeing you again next time. Bye-bye.